Welcome everybody to the Nocturnal Wildlife presentation. We're gonna get started in just a minute. So I just wanna make sure everybody's all logged in. If you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat bar there on the side and we will try to get to as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. So we'll wait just a minute though. All right, we're gonna get started now. We're gonna go down to Jade, who is down at the Maine Wildlife Park in Gray, and she has some special guests there with her. So here we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, my name is Jade, and I'm at the Maine Wildlife Park here in Gray. I am an educator for the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife here in Maine. And here at the park, we have many different species of native Maine wildlife. We have bears, moose, owls, uh, turtles, bobcats, beavers, and those are just to name a few. We have over 30 different species of native Maine uh, wildlife here. And all the animals that are here cannot live in the wild on their own. So they, um, in some cases, are orphaned, injured, or in some way human dependent and rescued. Um, so all the animals get to live the rest of their years here at the park where we take care of them. And if you want to learn more about the wildlife park, you can go to mainewildlifepark.com. Today, we are talking about nocturnal animals. And I want to talk first about just what nocturnal means, what it means to be nocturnal. So nocturnal animals are more active at night. They have special adaptations, um, which are features for surviving in the dark and during uh, the time of day that us as humans are not as active. Um, and these adaptations can help them do things like hunting, foraging, and just finding their way around, um, similar to how animals during the day get around, which they are called diurnal. So animals that are active during the day are diurnal, and animals that are active at night are called nocturnal. And nocturnal animals do have to compete with each other, um, but they don't have to compete with the animals that are active during the day. So this is an advantage that um, the daytime animals don't compete with the nocturnal animals directly, and the nocturnal animals don't have to compete with the diurnal animals directly. It's called a niche, and it's sort of like having a day shift and a night shift. So they do the same job, but they do it at different times of day, so they're not competing for the exact same resources. So it's pretty smart. And we have a lot of different nocturnal animals here in Maine. Um, an example of this kind of like niche switch would be hawks and owls. So both hawks and owls um, are flying predators. They're both raptors, but hawks are active during the day and owls are active during the night. So they eat a lot of the same different types of prey They behave in the same way, but because they're active at different times of the day, they can both survive on similar resources um, without competing directly with each other. And nocturnal animals, they do move in the cover of darkness and they have lots of different adaptations um, over their diurnal animal counterparts. Um, often they have fewer predators, less competition for food and water, and they can also be harder to det detect in the dark. Can you think of some animals living here in Maine that are more active at night? Some of the different animals that we'll talk about today are bats, raccoons, owls, and flying squirrels. And those are just to name a few of them. And noticing these animals in the wild can be a lot trickier for us because we are not nocturnal. Humans are adapted to being active during the day. But let's take a look at some of the special adaptations that animals use for living in the dark. 
So we'll start with some of the nocturnal animals that live on the ground. So they're scurrying around on the ground to move around at night. And one of the most recognizable ones that we'll talk about first are raccoons. So raccoons have those little black face masks and those tail stripes, those markings that really stand out. Um, you can always tell it's a raccoon, but we do have a special raccoon here at the park that doesn't have those markings. Um, he is albino. So he does not have any color pigment. Um, it's a genetic disorder. So he was born completely without color. So he looks a lot different than most of the raccoons we see in the wild. Our other raccoon here at the park does have that um, normal raccoon color with her striped tail and her little black mask and her um, dark brown, black kind of gray fur. And just like some of the other nocturnal animals we looked at, raccoons are able to see and hear very, very well. So as we're going along, we'll see that a lot of nocturnal animals have special senses for getting around and surviving at night. And for raccoons, that is their sense of hearing, their sense of smell, and also their sense of touch is very, very good. If you do see um, raccoons during the day, you don't need to be like freaked out or nervous or scared. Um, they can just be disturbed. Sometimes when they have their babies or they're just really hungry, they will be active during the day. Um, but if you ever are wondering if a raccoon might be sick or need help, you can always contact Inland Fisheries and Wildlife um, and we can try and give you some advice and help you out. One of your raccoon oh. friends is happen to be coming closer to you right now is watching them searching the ground with their hands and their nose. Yeah, this one down here closest to me right now is the one that I was talking about that has that normal um, raccoon color. So this is our female raccoon. And she is kind of showing off her sense of touch right now and that sense of smell. So she's using her nose to sniff out um, some acorns and other things like that that are here in her um, enclosure. And I don't know if you can see over on this side too. You might be able to see her moving a little bit. She's actually over at her pond. We can and see she'll her. Bring, oh, good. She'll bring her food over to the water and she'll actually wash it off. So I know we have little nicknames and stuff for raccoons and for them getting to our trash. And we might think of them as being kind of dirty, but they're actually very, very clean animals. They are constantly grooming themselves and cleaning themselves and they like their food to be clean too. So they bring it to the water and they wash it off before they eat it. So that sense of touch is really important to them. And we've actually found that raccoons have more nerves in their hands um, that gives them a heightened sense of touch. So they can actually feel vibrations and things in the ground that we can't feel. Um, and that's because they eat little um, insects and things like that that they find in the ground. Uh, some things that they'll find in the water too. So they can put their hands in the water and find uh, mussels and things like that in the water that they'll eat also. Their hands are kind of like ours. They're not a fully formed hand quite like us. They don't have a completely opposable thumb like people do, um, but it's very, very close to our hands. So they are really good at holding things and um, finding things with their hands. And that's called dexterity. That dexterity of being able to move their fingers and hold on to and grab things. I have here too a raccoon fur. So we can look a little bit closer at some of those markings I was talking about. So if we look at this tail, it's that striped tail and we can see that their fur is super thick. So they have really, really fluffy fur for staying warm and dry. Today it's pretty chilly out and it's rainy, but you can see they're still really active because they have these really thick fur coats and plenty of uh, fat layer to keep them nice and warm in all the different main weather that we have. We talked a little bit about the eye mask too, and it's sort of still a mystery to us why raccoons have those eye masks. Um, one possible idea is that it actually helps um, from glare. So kind of like a, like a football player, an athlete would put that black smudge under their eyes um, it's one idea that that has adapted over time to help the raccoons not have the glare in their eyes, but we don't know for sure. So it's still kind of a mystery. 
We'll also talk about another animal that moves around on the ground. And this is a larger nocturnal animal. And these are coyotes. And in just a second, we can play the sound of a coyote howl. I'm sure you've heard this before. So I know I live in town, so I hear that very, very um, uncommon to hear that for me. But when I used to live in a more rural area, I would hear that all the time at night. Um, and this isn't something you should be afraid of. This is just how they communicate with each other. Um, and it might sound a little bit scary, but it's not. It's just them talking back and forth and letting each other know where they're at. Um, that howling is going to be coyotes. We don't have wolves in Maine anymore. Um, they are extirpated. So if you hear that, it's definitely coyotes. Um, wolves don't make those sounds, especially those kind of higher pitch yips and things like that. So coyotes and fox are the only canines in Maine. Um, both are primarily nocturnal. And that doesn't mean that you won't see them running around during the day as well. Um, as we have developed and moved into their habitats, um, both coyotes and fox have learned and adapted to living pretty close to people. Um, so you can still, still see them in our neighborhoods and our more urban areas. Um, because they've adapted really well to kind of living amongst people. Um, they don't live in groups like wolves. Coyotes don't live in packs. Um, they're a lot more solitary, so they travel alone a lot more. And they're omnivores. I'm going to show you their skull here. So omnivores eat a combination of plants and other animals. So carnivores just eat other animals. Herbivores mostly eat plants. But coyotes eat some of both. So when we look at this skull, we see that their teeth are adapted for eating a lot of different kinds of food. In the front here, you can see those sharp canine teeth, and those are for ripping up um, meat. And then in the back, when you look at their molars, they're a lot flatter, all the way in the back here. And those are for grinding up plant material. Coyotes are gonna eat just about anything. Um, so they're gonna eat both meat and plants. So they'll eat things like rabbits, small rodents, sometimes deer or even um, carrion, which are like dead animals, but they'll also eat plants too. Like um, other canines, they rely very heavily on their sense of smell. So they have an amazing sense of smell, um, kind of like the raccoons here, they're gonna use their noses to um, find their different territories. So they use scent to mark their territories. And they're also gonna smell out their prey with their really good sense of smell. And they use scent to mark their territory, like I said. So they actually use their pee, they use their urine um, to spray around and it lets all the other coyotes know what areas are already um, being inhabited by another coyote and if they should go there or should not go there. Um, and they also use those howls and squeaks and yips to communicate. So a lot of different ways to communicate that are kind of different than how people communicate with each other. But not all uh, nocturnal animals move around on the ground. There are a few nocturnal animals that fly through the night. We're gonna play a call here and see if you can recognize this nocturnal animal that you might hear at night. So that is the sound of a barred owl. And again, that might sound kind of scary at night um, because you can't see them, but that is just because we're adapted to daytime. So they are used to communicating and to calling out like that at night. And it's kind of scares us, but that's just because we're not adapted to seeing and hearing things as well at night. And most owls are nocturnal. Um, again, you might hear or see them during the day because that doesn't mean they are never active during the daytime, but it means they're just most active at night. And I do have a big owl friend here to help show us some of these owl adaptations that help them um, find food and everything at night. So the first thing we'll talk about is their sight. 
they have these really big eyes, large forward facing eyes, and they have these special rods in their eyes that are especially adapted um, for low light. So really amazing um, vision. And you can also see that the, the size of their eyes compared to their head, like compared to people, our eyes are a lot smaller in comparison to the rest of um, our face. But as this owl, really, really big eyes compared to the rest of their face. Their um, feathers and their flight is also pretty special. We often say that owls have silent flight. And this is for sneaking up on their prey um, so their prey don't hear them coming. They have special um, feathers that uh, air passes through really, really quietly. So they can sneak up on their prey and their prey don't even hear them coming. When we look back at their face too, you can kind of see the feathers around their face are shaped like a circle. This is called their facial disc. And it actually um, points the sound towards their ears. So unlike people, their ears are actually um, not symmetrical on their heads. So their ears are placed on different areas of their head so they can hear in more of a 360 degree range. And if you wanna try this at home, you can cup your hands, one facing forward on your ear and one facing backwards on your ear. And it can kind of give you a sense of how uh, the owls hear. So is it like you had one ear that faced one direction and one that faced the other way. And that's kind of how it is for owls. Since their ears are placed in different areas of their head, it makes it so they can hear sound a lot more than we can. Another incredible thing about owls is that they can actually rotate their necks a lot further than we can. Um, we have only seven vertebrae, so seven neck bones up in our neck, and they actually have 14. So they have twice as many neck vertebrae as we do, and they can turn their heads 270 degrees. So not only do their ears help them here, but then again, they can also turn their heads a lot further than we can so they can see and hear in all directions. And here in Maine, we have uh, many different species of owl. Um, just to name a few, we have the great horned owl, which is like the one I was just holding and the ones that are pictured here. Those are great horned owls. We also have barred owls, Eastern screech, barn owls, and also snowy owls. And, and more. So the next one animal we're gonna talk about, nocturnal animal, I want you to try and guess. I'm gonna give you some clues. So it's a small mammal. It does look like it flies, but they actually can't fly. They glide through the air. And they also have really big eyes for seeing at night and they have bushy tails. Can you guess what the nocturnal animal is that we're talking about? They are flying squirrels. So like I said, flying squirrels cannot truly fly like an owl can, but they do have adaptations for gliding through the trees at night. They can glide over 200 feet through the air and most of their glides cover smaller gaps like 20 or 30 feet from tree to tree. And they have these very special body adaptations. So if we look at this one here, you can see it has these special folds of skin that connect its front and back legs on both sides. And it's kind of like a little parachute. So it's like if a person was skydiving, you'd um, deploy your parachute out and they have this built in parachute, these skin folds that make it so that they can glide. glide. So they can't like fly like a owl can but they can give the appearance that they're flying when they're gliding from tree to tree. And they can actually steer a little bit um, because they will use their tails and their legs and it can actually help them steer so they don't miss their targets. And they have those really, really big round eyes. Hold this one up again. Again, this is a mounted one, so it's not exact, but um, they have these really, really big eyes for helping them see at night. And they also have really big ears for hearing their predators. So even though those owls have almost silent flight, um, their prey, all these little rodents and stuff are trying to also adapt all the time to be better and better at 
knowing when their prey is coming, when their predators are coming, and the predators are trying to adapt so they can try and catch more prey. And these little ones are strictly nocturnal. So you will not see them out during the day. Um, they really do not like the daylight. They are gonna be out during only the evenings. Um, but if you wanna try and see them, you can watch your bird feeders at night. They'll often try and steal some seed from bird feeders. Um, and they do live in the forest in Maine. So our flying squirrels live in hardwood forests and conifer forests. Um, so if you're out in the woods at night, camping, hiking, uh, whatever you're doing, maybe you'll be able to catch one gliding in the treetops above you. So I mentioned that they can't actually fly, but there is a mammal here in Maine um, and all around the world that can fly. And these are bats. Bats are the only mammal that can truly fly. And they are also one of the most recognizable nocturnal animals. When we think of nocturnal animals, we often think of bats. And there are more than a thousand different species of bats worldwide, but we only have eight species that live here in Maine. And unfortunately, every single species that we have here in Maine is either endangered, threatened, or vulnerable. So we have the little brown bat and the um, northern long-eared bat, and those are both um, endangered here in Maine. And they are, um, the northern long-eared bat is federally threatened, so not good. Um, we also have the eastern small-footed bat, and they are um, threatened here in the state. And then we have three species of bat, no, sorry, four species of bat, um, the tricolor, the big brown, the ori, the red, and the silver-haired bat that are all species of special concern. So again, all the different species of bats that we have here um, are at risk and all those populations are not doing as well as they could be. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's not good for people and why we should care about and try and help these bats. But first to understand how these mammals can fly, we have to look at their wings and their bones. I have here, this is um, a bat that is sealed in resin. Sorry, I'm wiping it off. It is wet and rainy out here today. So this is a bat that is sealed in resin. Try and get it so it doesn't glare off my phone. There you go, we can see and it. Can, okay, good. So you can see that like mammals, they have this fur and everything, but they have modified um, wings here and their hands. So actually their arm bones and their hand bones are in here. So very different than our arms and hands. We're mammals just like bats are mammals. But obviously their arms and their hands and their skin is much different than us. And it makes it so they can fly. I'm pretty jealous. And that, uh, the family of bats is actually called um, Chiropectra, Chiro Chiropectera, <laughs> which means hand wing. And this makes sense because when we look at their wings, like you can see on this long-eared bat, it is like a hand, but it's also a wing. So that is why um, their name is hand wing because that hand like ours has been modified so they can fly. And they have this double layer of skin and it's this membrane that's stretched over their arm and their four fingers. And these all connect down to the back leg and all the way even between their back legs and their tail. So again, kind of like that flying squirrel, they have a built-in parachute, but with their parachute, they're not just gonna glide. They can actually sustain and control their flight. We'll look at some bones too here. This one doesn't have the membrane on it anymore, that skin on it anymore. So you can see the actual hand bones. And these are finger bones. All these little ones that go all the way down into their wings are actually like the bones in our fingers. So obviously when you look at my hand, very, very different bones in my hand than theirs. And it's because we use our hands for very different things. I am not using my hands to try and fly. Unfortunately, a lot of people do not like bats. Bats are often shown in scary movies and TV as being kind of scary or bad things. Um, and also because people worry about them carrying rabies. 
And the best way to avoid rabies is to never touch or approach wildlife. So there are all kinds of different mammals that can get rabies in addition to um, other diseases. So the best thing for everyone to do is to be safe and keep your distance from wildlife. Um, and that's not just bats, that's all wildlife. The best thing to avoid any kind of bad conflicts is to just give them their space and respect their space. But bats play a really important role in our ecosystem. Believe it or not, as humans, we would have a lot of trouble surviving if we did not have bats, if all the bats were gone. Across the world, bats are pollinators, they provide manure and control insects. And all the bats here in Maine are insectivores. So they only eat um, insects. A bat can eat um, nearly a thousand flying insects per hour. And that's about 3000 insects in one night. Um, the little brown bat that we have here in Maine can consume its own weight in insects each night. And then we have all kinds of different species here in Maine. Um, we have some what we call like house bats and they are commonly found in man-made structures. So they'll live in barns and things like that. And these are our little brown bats and our big brown bats. And they look very, very similar to each other. Um, kind of like their name describes, they're just little brown bats. And then we also have some migratory bats that only spend the summer in Maine and migrate south um, into warmer places where they can get more insects year round. Um, when it's not summertime. And those are the red bats, the silver haired bats, and the ori bats. And uh, bats primarily navigate and hunt using sound, and this is known as echolocation. Um, so they let out this really high pitched sound. It's so high pitched that humans um, can't even hear it. And when that hits off of an insect, um, the sound bou bounces back at them. And it's sort of like um, playing Marco Polo or something like that, except instead of you trying to be sneaky and not saying polo back, the insect has no choice. That sound is gonna bounce off of it and bounce back to the bat and the bat's gonna be able to grab it. And bats can detect an object as thin as human hair with this echolocation. So very, very special adaptation that they have. And some insects have actually adapted, kind of like I was talking about with owls and rodents. Some insects have adapted to evade this echolocation. Um, they send off their own signal warnings. So some of them have another signal that sends back. And sometimes this is actually a warning that that animal might be poisonous or something like that. Um, and sometimes it's just their way that they can fly. They know when that echo hits off of them, that sound from the bat hits off of them, they dive bomb out of the air so the bat doesn't catch them. So it can be pretty interesting to watch if you've ever seen bats flying around trying to catch insects, um, the kind of battle that goes back and forth trying to catch them. And it does make sense if you're a little bit afraid of bats because they do swoop around and fly around. Um, but the only reason they're doing that is because it's nighttime and we also attract insects. So they are not trying to swoop and uh, do anything bad to us. They're just trying to catch their food. They're trying to catch those bugs that are flying around us. And I hate bugs. I don't like, especially biting insects like mosquitoes and stuff. I don't like them. So I'm happy that the bats eat those insects. If a bat is ever in your house, the best thing you can do is just open up a door or window um, and let them fly out. A very small percent of bats actually carries rabies. Um, it's about four out of every 100 bats that test positive for rabies each year here in Maine. So really low percentage. And there is a new disease that is really hurting bat populations. Um, this is called white nose syndrome. And it's a new fungal disease that was first discovered in New York in 2006. And it is named after this white fungus, these spores that infect the bats. You can see in these pictures, um, exactly why it's called white nose syndrome. It's a white fungus that's on their faces around their noses. And this has killed millions of hibernating bats and it continues to spread west. Um, in Maine, it has kind of more recently gotten here. Um, just in the last few years, we've noticed that it's really starting to hurt some of our populations, especially our little brown bat and our northern long-eared bats. Um, we believe that they've declined by over 90% since this white nose syndrome has 
um, found its way to Maine. And we do survey for white nose syndrome. Um, we do this by um, checking in on bat caves uh, where these bats are hibernating. Unfortunately, during our 2011 surveys, that is when we found that bats at two sites in Oxford County um, with visible signs of white nose syndrome, um, that fungus on their wings and their noses. So how can we help bats? We know what's hurting them. We know um, kind of the problems, but how, what can we do to actually help bats? People can help bats by, by avoiding pesticides and chemicals um, in their yards and in their gardens. So trying to use um, products that are organic or that don't have as harmful as pesticides and chemicals. Um, also by maintaining some things on your property um, that a lot of people like to get rid of, things like snags. So snags are actually dead trees, but even though that tree is dead, it is providing a home for a lot of bats. Um, they also like to um, roost in um, little crevices and things like that. So having a bat house um, on your property can also help keep bats out of your home and in a bat house instead. Um, you just have to do your research before you buy or build the bat house because you want to make sure um, it's the right style and everything because you don't want to make things worse. And most importantly, you want to avoid visiting bat caves um, during their really, really um, sensitive hibernation period. And that's from October 1st until April 30th. So make sure you are not interrupting these bats during their very important hibernation periods because that can unfortunately kill bats. So we have only scratched the surface on nocturnal um, animals here in Maine and some of their special adaptations. I'm sure some questions have come up. So I would love to answer any questions that anyone has about nocturnal animals here in Maine. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about bats, but I think you've got some of those questions about hibernation um, and ways to help bats. And we do want to remind people that if you do find a bat um, in your house, if it's been around children or somebody who was sleeping, that um, those are the times that you do want to be um, cautious um, because a bat is so small, it can be sometimes hard to tell um, if they've if they've bitten. But like Jade said, there's a a low percentage, but it's always good to be to be cautious and, and at call if you have any questions. Um, but we did have um, some questions that did not get answered about owls, like such as would they eat things like a chicken? That's a great question. Um, so an owl's ideal meal is not going to be a chicken. Um, they really like little rodents and things like that. Um, so small mammals, um, sometimes even smaller birds, or if it's a large owl, sometimes they'll even eat other smaller owls. Um, so they're not really going to go after a chicken unless they are in dire need of a meal. They might try and go after a chicken, but that's a little bit larger um, than what they're going to be going for. And it's not really part of their like wild, normal diet. Um, another question, um, and a couple people were interested to learn that coyotes do eat plants and are not just carnivores, but like what types of plants would they be going to eat, if you know? Yeah, so um, here at the Wildlife Park, we give our coyote a different kind of mixture each day of um, some meat, but we also try and supplement that with some fruits and veggies. So they're not going to be eating things that are really sugary. So like to us, Yummy fruits are things like um, apples and oranges and all these things. Um, but we are trying to keep things that are um, nutritious without all the sugars. So um, even some greens, but out in the wild, um, they might even kind of just chew on grass, berries, um, things like that that they're going to find. They'll even dig up worms and um, smaller things like that from the ground. So it's not just catching rabbits or mice or things like that. They're very opportunistic, um, so they're going to eat really whatever they can find. And now we want to have a question about the uh, raccoons. They're wondering about raccoons and um, if they hibernate or if they're active during the winter. Yeah, so raccoons do not hibernate. Um, we have I can only think of one animal that truly hibernates here in Maine, and that is our um, groundhogs or our woodchucks. Um, bears are actually not even considered a true hibernator. 
because they will actually wake up and kind of move around and things like that during the winter. Um, but our other small mammals like raccoons and porcupines, skunks, um, they stay active and they are out moving around in the winter, just not quite as much. They are trying to conserve their energy because they're not able to find as much food in the winter. Um, so when that kind of food source dwindles, their activity level also is gonna be a little bit slower, but they do not hibernate. They're still out and about. And do raccoons, uh, are they always found near water? No, so um, they do need water to survive. They do need water for drinking. Um, and some of the foods that they enjoy are aquatic, are found in water. Um, so they do need to be by a source of water to survive, but you won't only see them near water. You might find them a little bit further um, into the woods or further from a body of water. Um, but some of the foods they enjoy are in the water and they do need water to drink and survive. So they will need to buy, be by a fresh water source for those reasons. And I had a, a special note here that goes with this next question. Um, it says, Maria, age five, is asking, do raccoons hide in logs to avoid predators and people? Yeah, we actually here at the park have a couple of hollow logs for them. Um, they do like hiding out in there and that is a safe space for them. And that is to hide from their predators um, that aren't gonna be as good at climbing as they are. I don't think I mentioned before about their little hands. Um, I said they use them a lot for finding food, but they're also amazing climbers. So um, our logs here, we have a couple that are up off the ground and a couple that are down on the ground, um, but they do like hiding out in those little nooks and crannies, uh, kind of their safe places and their homes. And there's also an interest in if these raccoons have names. Yeah, so um, the male albino one um, doesn't have a name, but the other one is named CJ. Um, she's actually named after one of our old staff people that um, just doesn't work at the park here anymore now, but we did name her in honor of him. So she is named CJ in honor of one of our um, past superintendents here at the park. And uh, this isn't a question, but it is an observation that um, the albino raccoon, the little white one, he seems to be um, interested in something. Yes, so they have a lot of oak trees here around um, their enclosure and oak trees produce acorns and it's one of their favorite little treats. So as they eat all the acorns that fall inside, he is very good at reaching out and trying to get every single acorn that's also with an arm's reach outside. So he will go out and around and he will sniff them out and then use his long arms and hands to grab through and reach acorns. He might show off his climbing skills. <laughs> oh, there we go. They're very curious and very smart animals. Um, and they do associate most of us who work here at the park as food um, because we are always bringing them their lunch every day and toys and fun things like that. So now that he's done searching for acorns and he knows that we are here chatting with each other, he wants to uh, steal the show. Uh, and I don't know <laughs> if anybody has noticed, but one of the other raccoons just came out of a log. <laughs> Quite showing off their skills today. Yep, and now he's washing his hands. <laughs> he got them dirty when he was looking for acorns, so now he's getting them all cleaned up. And one thing that I had learned from a um, wildlife rehabilitator was raccoons actually sometimes, especially with drier foods, will um, get water um, when they're eating that food because they don't create as much um, saliva in their mouth and it kind of helps them. When, when eating that, and if, and if that's something um, you guys have noticed with your raccoons, that they like to drink a lot of water when they eat? I've never noticed that specifically, um, but it makes a lot of sense. I know they, um, we've done for enrichment too. We've actually put some um, mussels like with the, the shells on them um, into their pond and they will dig them out and they will crack them open and eat them. Um, so that's one of the types of enrichment that we do here for the raccoons. 
um, to try and replicate that kind of behavior that they would do in the wild. And there's another question about um, raccoons. Do they store any food or do they just eat food right away when they find it? They eat food right away when they find it. So not quite like squirrels. Um, squirrels are known for hoarding and storing their food um, for the season when their food is not as easy to find. Um, but that is partially due to probably people too. We provide some food to raccoons that um, for them with their really good dexterity in their hands is easy for them to get to. So they don't really have to worry about uh, storing food over the winter. They can find plenty of it. I think we'll watch the raccoon at this moment because we seem to be um, done with our, our questions. The other raccoons come over and say hi to. I don't know if you can see her down there, but we this can is the one her. that's named CJ. And she's newer here at the park. Um, the albino raccoon, he's been here um, for several years, but this female just got just came here this year. Um, she cannot see or has really poor vision in one of her eyes from an eye injury. Um, and she was orphaned, so that's why she's here. So that's all we have for questions. I don't know if any other ones have come in since then. But if we are also on questions, I did want to suggest a couple um, activities that we can do to um, sort of test our own nocturnal senses. Um, the one I'm going to demonstrate for you is sort of a mystery touch box. So this is simply a empty tissue box. Um, and we put some fun stickers on it so you can decorate your box however you'd like to. We put fun wildlife stickers on ours. And what you do is without looking, you do this with a partner or with a group of people and you pick a random object and you put it into the box without telling them what it is. And then without looking at it, they just feel inside. They kind of use their raccoon hands and feel around and try and guess what object was put inside um, without looking at it. So I just for fun put a little loon statue in there. But you can just find little knickknacks from all around your house um, and it's a super easy, fun way to test your sense of touch. Um, another activity I mentioned earlier, kind of with Marco Polo with the echolocation. Um, so we have a little twist on that called bat and moth. And what you do is instead of being Marco and Polo, you're a bat trying to find your moth. Um, so again, you don't use your eyesight, you just use sound to try and find your um, moth if you're the bat. And there's also an activity on our website, a sound mapping activity. Um, that's another one for testing your senses and using your senses um, when you're outside. So that's another activity that you can find on our website too. Have any other questions come in? Not except, uh, can we visit the mountain lions? But I don't okay. think we can get to that today. It's a little far away. <laughs> Yeah, but um, the Wildlife Park is open until November 11th. That is our last day. Um, so if you want to visit the park, you can still come. Uh, we do close for the winter and then we reopen in the spring every year. So um, if you want to visit us before we close, you'll have to get here before Veterans Day. Um, and if not, you can visit us again when we open in the spring. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. I hope you had fun learning about some of Maine's nocturnal animals. Um, and if you want to check out our website, you can see more uh, virtual programs that we recorded in the past um, and activities to do at home um, just by going to mefishwildlife.com. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>